Good morning. Thank you for joining us on our webinar this morning. I hope everyone is in good health and in good spirits. These are challenging times of uncertainty, confusion, and in some cases, fear. So we wanted to do all we could to keep you informed. And as a result, we organized this Antares Investment Management Webinar. We thought it would be a good idea in light of the unprecedented events surrounding COVID-19 in the capital markets to give you an opportunity to hear directly from your portfolio managers. We are fortunate to have Alec McIsaac and Ricardo Mello join us from Antares. Many of you know Alec and Ricardo. They manage the Antares total equity and balance portfolios, which are the mandates you all participate in. So these are the folks making the decisions in your portfolio. Based in Winnipeg now, Alec grew up in Edmonton and Ricardo in Mexico City. They both list themselves as big fans of Liverpool FC. I suppose if they supported different teams, that would be more interesting, but in times like these, seeing eye to eye and being on the same page probably helps. Before we get going, we have a few housekeeping items to cover. This is our first webinar. We wanted to get this information to you quickly, so please be patient if we run into any technical challenges. During the presentation, feel free to ask questions. All attendees' microphones have been muted to cut down on background noise. So in order to ask a question, please use the chat box provided in the upper right-hand corner. It says Q&A on the icon. We will have one of the Blackburn Davis financial team bring these questions forward to Alec and Ricardo. If you're not able to ask your question or you think of something afterwards, of course they will be available offline via phone or email. There should be an icon of a microphone under each speaker. Make sure that it's unmuted or you won't be able to hear the presenter. As this is a first time for us, any feedback is greatly appreciated. Even well after our social distancing requirements have passed, we may continue with this sort of event if it is well received and you find value in it. Gentlemen, are you ready to go? And Alec, you're good, unmuted now, thanks. Okay, can you hear me okay? I'm gonna assume yes, and I know everyone else's microphone is muted. So um, Kelly, thank you for the introduction. Blackburn Davis, thank you all for hosting this call. We are grateful to be able to speak uh, to clients. Um, before I start with the presentation, one thing I want to say to you is that we are in the same boat. And, and I, I say that because Ricardo and I invest all of our personal family long-term investments in the same strategies that you are in. And in fact, this is also true for our extended families and many of our close friends. So all in, we feel very much the burden of responsibility and, uh, and you know, when, when things go up or down, we are experiencing the very same things you are. So I wanted to share that with you so that you know uh, that we're uh, right alongside you here. Okay, having said that, I'm going to start by giving a little bit of context for where we are uh, in terms of the markets. What you see on your slide right now is uh, a 10 year chart of the Standard & Poor's 500 index. This is essentially a proxy for United States stocks. Uh, the first uh, obvious observation is that it has been a good decade in the main. In general, uh, equities have gone up. Now, of course, they started from a bit of a low point at the end of the financial crisis that kind of finished in 2009. But in general, they've gone up. And the reason for that is that corporate earnings have gone up. Stock markets, stock prices go up when corporate earnings rise because effectively rising earnings means the underlying business that the stock price represents is becoming more valuable. And that shows up in rising sales, rising profits, typically higher dividends to, to uh, shareholders, etc. And at the very far right of this uh, chart, you see the line plunging down somewhat. It's, not, it's nowhere near where it was 10 years ago, but this is the downturn in equities and the subsequent partial bounce up that we have experienced in the past six weeks or so. So um, I guess what I want to say is that, uh, uh, you know, we, we are in uh, an economy that is an open economy and things don't go in a straight line. So as we all know, economies experience recessions and we have not had a recession since 2008, 2009. 
typically the historic pattern is that there is a recession on average every five or six years. So this economic expansion has been long in the tooth. And in our view, um, we have been due for some kind of uh, economic uh, you know, downturn. And typically when there's an economic downturn, corporate earnings decline and there is a, a parallel decline in stock prices. So I guess what I'm saying is that whether or not uh, we had a global pandemic, which is the trigger for the downturn right now, it seems uh, evident to us at Interis that there would have been a downturn at some point, you know, sooner or later. The timing is always impossible to predict, but there always is a catalyst. Sometimes it's a war, uh, sometimes it's, uh, you know, something, you know, price of oil going one way or another. Uh, in this case, it was a pandemic, so it's an, an, it's an unusual uh, catalyst, but there always is a catalyst. This catalyst is a bit different. So uh, having said that, um, uh, what I want to do now, having laid the table, is uh, I want to talk about the approach that we employ at Antares, how it is that we have been preparing for a downturn uh, in your portfolios. So first, I'm going to start with uh, a portion of a por your portfolio that invests in fixed income. Now, most clients have a fixed income component to their portfolio. Uh, fixed income is typically comprised of bonds. So why are bonds in a portfolio? Well, there are two reasons. The first reason is that bonds provide an investment return. Uh, the investment return admittedly is not as high doesn't have the same potential as that of equities, but importantly, it tends to be a source of stability in a portfolio. So a bond will pay interest, and at the end of the bonds period, it will pay the principal back to the investor. Uh, and there are different issuers of bonds that we can invest in on your behalf. Um, what you see on the screen right now is a continuum of different uh, different types of bonds as they are rated by the rating agencies. And all that means is uh, some uh, bond issuers are of high quality, and these are the ones at the left of your screen circled in green. So these types of bonds are highly reliable in terms of the likelihood of getting your money back. And the ones at the far right are more low, are, are rated in a lower way, and, and, and that's because they have less consistency of cash flow and therefore are more at risk of, uh, you know, an investor or a lender of a bond is more at risk of getting his or her money back. So these are companies that don't have consistent earnings. You see Air Canada in there. We all know that right now in the slowdown, very few airplanes are flying. So a bit of a riskier profile at the far right. There are different ways to make money in the bond market, but we at Antares focus uh, our attention and your money on the high quality bonds. And the reason for that is we don't want this part of your portfolio to provide any unpleasant surprises. We want the interest, we want the money back at the end of the term. And therefore we focus on A, double A and occasionally triple A bonds. Um, that's what we do here to avoid the surprises. And our view is quite simple. If that section of your portfolio is stable and reliable. It provides a ballast, which provides you with comfort, some investment return, and the risk that we're taking within the context of your overall portfolio will be in the equities. And we believe that's the appropriate place to put it. And then what we do is we focus on mitigating that risk in order to maximize your long-term return. And that's what I'm gonna talk about now. So, I'm going to talk about the process that we employ with every company that we research on your behalf. Many companies don't get included in the portfolio, but we do the work on them, thinking maybe one day we will buy them. And of course, the companies that are in the portfolio that have gone through the process and we revisit the process periodically to make sure that the reasons that we initially put your money into a given stock still apply. So you have in front of you an image of a three-legged stool, and we use this just to simplify things. Obviously, it's more complicated, but we simplify it by talking about three key criteria for every business that we own for you. The first thing we look for is a strong balance sheet. What is a balance sheet? A balance sheet is part of the financial statements that lists on the one side the assets and on the other side 
the liabilities. So it's the liabilities we care about. We care about the debt. Um, companies use debt to expand and, and it's a legitimate source of capital uh, to, to borrow. Just as, as individuals, we take out mortgages in order to buy a house. That's a very legitimate thing to do. But what we want to do is we don't want to own businesses that have up and down earnings and very high levels of debt because it's the high level of debt that gets companies into trouble. And indeed, this is what we are seeing right now in the market because so many businesses have seen their sales plummet. I mean, we see it at the local level, restaurants being shut down, hotels, uh, air, airlines, et cetera. Any, any, anything related to, to, uh, with uh, discretionary spending have had their sales and profits cut severely right now. So if you're in that type of business, you don't want a lot of debt because those interest payments are still payable. Um, so number one, we want strong companies. And you know, the beauty of owning a strong company is not just that the strong company gets through downturns. On top of that, they're in a position to look at their competitors and sometimes they can buy a portion of a competitor's business or even an entire competitor. They can buy them with the strong balance sheet. And by doing that, they increase their earnings power long term uh, without issuing new shares. So it's uh, it's cash is king uh, in, in short, uh, particularly in downturns. OK, number two, we focus on profits uh, of a company and and you know, as I said, just as I said, there are different ways of making money in the bond market. There are also different ways of making money in the stock market. Some are more speculative. That's not our game. And some are more about being a, a, a rational long term investor. And that's what we strive to be. So a rational investor is going to look at a business that has profits. So when we look for a business, we are looking typically for a decade of profits. We want those profits to um, to have, you know, we want them to be rising because sales are rising, margins are rising, and we want that to be reflected also in the form of dividends that are distributed to shareholders, ideally rising. If we can do that, odds are in your favor that the companies are going to be more valuable long term, and if they're more valuable long term, they will be worth more in the stock market. And I oppose that to companies that don't have a history of profitability. You know, it was only two or three years ago that we were getting a lot of phone calls, people asking about cannabis stocks. And, you know, our, our answer was quite simple. You know, will, will you be, are you looking at cannabis stocks? And the answer was no, because none of these companies had any sales. If you don't have sales, you don't have profits. And that's not to say that some of these companies will not be valuable in the future, but it's very hard to predict who the winners and losers are gonna be at an early stage uh, type of business. So we just avoid it. We don't need to add that type of risk to your portfolio because the odds of being wrong are pretty high. We want the odds to be in your favor. Okay, the third thing we focus on is we want the price relative to the value of the business to be fair. Um, and, and that's an important consideration because if we overpay for a good business, uh, you know, the price relative to the value of the business, if they diverge too much, typically what happens is you need to wait a long time for the profits to catch up to the price. So if we can get something where the price versus the value is more or less in line, we say we love buying great companies for a fair price. Better yet, we like to get them for a bargain. Sometimes the market gives you bargains, sometimes it doesn't. I can tell you in the current market environment where some parts of the market have come down a fair bit in price, uh, there are bargain possibilities, but always it's not just the price we, we, we focus on. We focus on all three of these items and make sure that they make sense together. Uh, and again, that, uh, that tilts the odds in, in our favor as investors. Okay, so having described our process at a high level, I'm now going to give you an example and then I'm going to hand the uh, microphone over to my colleague Ricardo who will give you a few more examples. So the first example is Microsoft. This is a company we're all familiar with. And indeed, this call is being hosted, if you will, on Microsoft Teams. Um, we put these slides together on Microsoft PowerPoint. We do our analysis in Microsoft Excel and for the uh, the right to use this software, we pay uh, 
we pay subscription fees and Microsoft collects them and they make scads of profit from millions of businesses all over the world. This is a gift that keeps on giving to the parent company. So if you can't beat them, you ought to own them, we say. So we want to be owners of this business. It is a great business and I can tell you, you know, it's been a great business for a long period of time, but the price hasn't always been right. Um, anyone who is probably 40 years or older will remember the technology uh, stock bubble, the dot-com bubble of the late 1990s. Well, at the end of 1999, there were tons of dot-com companies that came out on the market, not unlike the cannabis stocks of a few years ago. And when the bubble burst, as they always do, uh, the market realized that they weren't making any money and they disappeared. Microsoft was a technology company whose shares had gone up a great deal to something like $65, but their profits just weren't high enough. So although it was a great company that met criteria one and two of that three-legged stool, it did not mean meet criteria number three. And as a result, someone who bought the shares at the end of 1999 had to wait 13 years just to get the stock to the same price level. Well, we bought it much later and it's been a very a great um, performer in the portfolio, uh, both in the up, uh, the, the rising market and also in the down market because it has so much cash on its balance sheet, as you can see on the slide. The one uh, final point I want to make about Microsoft is that um, you know, it is a cash cow with its traditional businesses that I mentioned a moment ago, but it is also an early and big mover into the cloud. And the cloud is simply the notion that data are being stored on large server farms somewhere else and we can access that information no matter where we are, as opposed to the old days where you had the server in your office. So this is the shift to the cloud is a long term phenomenon that is still in very early stages and there are two big players right now amazon and microsoft it's an area of significant future growth and that i believe is another contributing factor to uh the the stock the stock having done well and in our opinion the likelihood of this continuing uh in the foreseeable future so I've said that much about Microsoft. I'm now going to hand the microphone over to Ricardo and I will do the uh, the uh, switching of slides. So Ricardo, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you, Alec, and, and thank you everyone. Good morning. Uh, I hope everyone's doing well and staying healthy at home. Um, so, so what I wanted to do is go through a few companies in, in, that you own in the portfolio um and, and how they fit in that in the portfolio based on uh the investment criteria that uh, that alex spoke about and, and the first company that i wanted to talk about is is apple um now we all know uh apple is known for its iconic uh iphone they were pioneers in in the smart smartphone business um what attracted us to 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 apple and the reason we own it um was not because of the iPhone itself, uh, but 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 really what comes with it uh, once you become an iPhone owner, uh, and this is what we call the whole ecosystem, uh, which involves the many apps that you have on your phone, uh, music, Apple Pay, health, uh, the health app, uh, the Apple Store. Um, what we found was that once you're part of that ecosystem. It is very difficult uh, for you as a customer uh, to switch to a competitor. Uh, so, so we believe that Apple has in fact created uh, an addictive product um, and therefore the company can generate uh, consistent profits uh, from both the iPhone uh, and, and all the services, the ecosystem that, 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 that come with it. Now, one of the um, very interesting things about Apple is that is its balance sheet. Um, Apple has over $200 billion essentially sitting in their bank account. Um, this gives Apple a lot of flexibility to, to make acquisitions, invest, invest within the company, uh, or even return some of that cash to shareholders via dividends or buybacks. But to put this into perspective, uh, $200 billion, this is US dollars, um, that is more value than Canada's most valuable company, 
which is the Royal Bank of Canada that has a market capitalization or, or is worth uh, in the market today uh, about 89, $89 billion. Um, that is just amazing. Basically, Apple could basically buy its own bank if they, if they wanted to. I don't think they're in that business, but uh, just wanted to put that into perspective. Um, now, the next company that, that I wanted to talk about uh, is uh, Novo Nordisk. Uh, Novo Nordisk is a, is a pharmaceutical company based out of Denmark, and they focus on developing diabetes and obesity drugs. Um, to give you some, 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 some context here, Novo Nordisk has over 46% market share in the insulin market for diabetes and 56% market share in the obesity uh, segment. Uh, now this segment is relatively new as, as obesity uh, has just in 2013 became recognized as a, as a disease by the American Medical Association. Um, but unfortunately, diseases like diabetes have no cure. Patients must continue to take insulin uh, or other, other diabetes products for, for basically the rest of their lives. Um, and, and the trends worldwide are not getting any better. Uh, and numbers in diabetes uh, cases and, and obesity as well continue to grow. Uh, so the demand for these drugs will continue uh, to increase as well. Um, and, and, and that will help uh, Novo Nordisk and, and, and continue to keep that consistency uh, in their profits. And, and what we also found with uh, through our research with Novo Nordisk is that once a patient has been using uh, any of Novo Nordisk's drugs uh, without any or, or, with, or with minimal side effects, it is very difficult to switch to a different treatment uh, from a different company um, because patients don't want to risk the, the an increase uh, the chance of, of side effects uh, uh, occurring with other treatments. Uh, so basically, many patients stick with what they know uh, for health reasons, obviously, uh, and, and that's what gives uh, uh, Novo Nordisk uh, some predictability and consistency in, in the cash flows that, uh, that they generate. Uh, and lastly, the company that, that, that I wanted to talk about um, is, is a Canadian company uh, called Brookfield, Brookfield Infrastructure. Um, now, Brookfield Infrastructure is a global owner and operator of infrastructure assets. Uh, for example, natural gas pipelines, electricity transmission lines, railway lines, toll roads, data centers. Um, so these are assets that, that are very, very difficult to build and replicate. And therefore, it is very difficult for a competitor to come in and take market share uh, from, from companies like Brookfield. Um, now, what makes this company unique, and, and, and again, we're talking about cash flow, um, is the fact that 95% of their cash flows are regulated or, or contracted, um, and a lot of these cash flows are, are actually indexed to inflation. So the company, each and every year, the company has an idea on average as to how much cash flow they're going to generate. Um, and, and, and again, that, that goes back to that consistency uh, and predictability in, in, in cash flows. Uh, and, and in terms of uh, balance sheet strength, uh, again, this company owns very high quality assets that are very difficult to replicate. Um, uh, and it also has $1.2 billion in cash and short term investments that could potentially be used for to purchase more infrastructure assets uh, at attractive prices. Um, um, now, in terms of wh what the company looks like uh, when it comes to debt, uh, well, this is a company that manages debt very carefully, and they state that in, in, in basically every investment presentation. As, as a matter of fact, one 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 thing that I that I found through my research was that uh, because of Brookfield's large scale, um, you know, a lot of banks tend to offer them uh, attractive uh, loans. But Brookfield actually prefers to take on usually less uh, money than what the uh, bank's actually offering. So they're, they're very careful with, with, with their balance sheet, uh, and, and that's what we like as, as investors. Uh, now, for, for a few final remarks, uh, as we have, uh, have said, um, quality is very important. Uh, we believe that high quality companies, especially the ones that meet our three criteria, will, will, will do fine. 
and, and they'll likely we believe they'll come out likely come out out of a recession in a stronger competitive position. Again, they have the cash, they have the predictability and cash flow. They will do just fine. Um, what we've done is we, we've looked past in, in the past month with all this market volatility. What we've noticed is that the companies that have the strongest balance sheets uh, were the ones that went down uh, the least uh, during this period. So, so that again, balance sheet strength, profitability uh, speaks for itself. Um, and, and lastly, what I'd like to say is that uh, it is important to, to stick to our, pro, to our process. Um, during periods of high uncertainty, uh, investors tend to react and, and sometimes overreact in a matter that is not necessarily consistent uh, with their process, and, and, and that can lead to trouble. Uh, so sticking to our process is vital to good long-term outcomes, um, and, and, and that's the key. Uh, there's going to be short-term volatility. We know that. We're here for the long haul, and, and, and we, we think of um, our interests are our interests are aligned with your interest, and 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 they they, they happen to be long term uh, uh, interest. So, um, so that concludes uh, my presentation. Uh, I'm gonna thank you so much for your time. I'm gonna give this back to Stephen, I believe, for a set of uh, questions. Perfect. Thanks, uh, Ricardo and and Alec. I appreciate that. Um, Alec, this question is for you. This one is the first question of uh, about three or four that came in. Uh, given the state of current markets, do you foresee a change with the current asset allocation between your Canadian holdings and US holdings? Yeah, so that's a good question. Um, uh, the way I would put it is this. Um, we invest in great companies. Uh, some of those companies happen to be in Canada, but the world is a big place and there are more great companies in other parts of the world. So our portfolios typically, while they have a healthy proportion of Canadian holdings because you, our clients, are in Canada and spending money in Canadian dollars, we look everywhere for great companies. So the US, as you mentioned, Stephen, also other parts of the world as exemplified by Novo Nordisk, a Danish company. So we will look everywhere. And so therefore, we don't think of, um, when we go and look for, for new investments, we don't think of it in terms of, we're gonna put X much in Canada and Y much in the US and Z much in another part of the world. Rather, it all comes back to the company. So I guess the short answer is no, not really. Um, uh, when I When I think about, uh, changes we've made to the portfolio in the last few weeks. Uh, we've trimmed some positions in both Canada and the US. Uh, we sold a Japanese company. Um, we sold a US based company and we have purchased uh, one Canadian company uh, and we're in the process of purchasing another Canadian company. So, but that is derivative of looking for great companies, not a top down decision. Thank you. Thank you, Alec. Um, so you you talked a little bit about uh, some opportunities that you have taken. Can you can you elaborate a little bit further on on those types of companies, or or maybe give the listeners an idea of which names you might have added to, or which names you would have trimmed? Sure. Um, well, I'll start. Uh, I'll, I'll give I'll give you one example of. Uh, a high quality company that we nevertheless decided to trim. And I'll give you an example of a new business in the portfolio. So recently we uh, exited um, our holdings in TJX companies. And TJX companies is an excellent retailer. They, uh, anyone in Canada is familiar with the winners change, uh, chain rather, uh, as well as uh, Marshalls and HomeSense. They are a great business and they normally do well in a recession. The problem with TJX and the reason we sold it is right now 100% of their global stores are closed as well as 100% of their online business. So factually, we know that sales and profits are going to be zero. Well, the, the profits will probably be negative. And uh, we don't believe that the value of the shares reflects the possibility of 
uh, this pandemic going on a little further than some might hope. We have no idea. We don't know how long it's going to last. Nobody knows. We hope it ends quickly, but if it doesn't uh, and they continue to have depressed sales, uh, stocks typically don't do well when they have no sales. So we just elected to exit it for now. We hope we can get it back in the future for a cheaper price. So that's an example of something we have disposed of, uh, at least for now. Um, in terms of companies we've purchased, well, we recently purchased a, a Canadian-based company called Nutrien. Um, Nutrien is a brand name most people wouldn't know, but you might know from driving on the highways, you might have seen um, uh, some uh, elevators or, or, or rather some sort of fertilizer containers with the name Agrium on it. Well, Agrium is a Calgary-based company. Uh, Nutrien is the, 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 the name of uh, the old Agrium and Potash Corp of Saskatchewan. So basically, they sell fertilizers to the world and they also have a store base that is global and very difficult to replicate that sells large quantities of fertilizer and seeds and stuff like that. And this is a company that had been on our radar for some time and in the recent downturn, the shares came down that much more. And we kind of look at it and we say, unlike TJX that sells blue jeans, which are a discretionary purchase, this one sells fertilizers and seeds. We know that people need to eat. We know that the world uh, population is growing and we believe that governments are going to be extra motivated to make sure that crops are good and distributed to their populations, especially if the pandemic endures. And like I said, no idea about the duration of the pandemic, but it's a good business regardless. We think it might be poised to be an even better business in the event things are worse than, than expected. And in the meantime, they generate significant cash flow. The dividend yield is 5% in change. So an attractive cash in our, in our genes while we wait and, and a growth strategy with the store. So there's a couple of examples for you, Stephen. Thanks, Alec. That was, uh, that was great. Uh, Ricardo, I've got a question for you here. Sure. Um, what impact do you see the amount of debt that governments around the world have been spending um, having on the portfolio? Like, obviously, um, some Canadians are concerned that uh, as we con continue to s throw money at the problem, uh, it will help us come out of the problem, but then it leaves us a little bit short three to yeah. five years from now. So what 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 have you guys, maybe what's your thoughts, and then what do you think um, you would do to protect people against that risk? Yeah, so so I think in this case, uh, with what the governments have done recently, um, it, it seems like it, it, it was the right thing to do, given the severity and, and how quickly things changed just in the past month. Um, and, and the challenge is always going to be stepping back from, from bailouts. Um, uh, I mean, eventually companies that borrow too much um, will, will have to stand on their own feet. Uh, and, and, and we believe um, that, you know, there's a possibility that, uh, you know, all this debt out there, uh, government debt and corporate debt at some point may come back uh, uh, to, to her to her companies. We're starting to see that right, right now with, with, you know, for example, some of the companies in the energy sector. Um, that's why in our process, we're, we're focusing on companies that uh, have manageable levels of debt, uh, ideally more cash than debt, uh, because we believe that long term, despite what happens with, uh, with the, you know, with, with all the debt that's been taken out in, in the market, uh, the companies that have clean balance sheets uh, will be able to gain market share from competitors. And some of these competitors are the ones that have a lot of debt already. Um, uh, so, uh, so, so we believe that if we stick to, 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 to that, to the process of finding high quality companies with clean balance sheets uh, will, will lead to good uh, results uh, over a long period of time. Thanks for that. I appreciate that. So one one other question that um, we've received from various people over the last little while is, hey, if I've got some cash or I'm selling a business and I've got cash that I would like to add, um, when do you two see that as a good time to to deploy that cash and are you doing it you know in one foul swoop or are you doing it kind of in phases 
Go ahead, Ricardo. Oh, sorry. Yeah, yeah so um, good question. Obviously, market uh, volatility has presented us with, with, with opportunities. Um, I, I think the, the way with the way we're doing this is we're not uh, we're, we're doing it cautiously. We're not backing up the truck at this point. Uh, the, the truth is markets have recovered a little bit in the past couple of weeks, uh, but we just nobody really knows. We don't know. I mean, as a matter of fact, Charlie Munger uh, from Berkshire Hathaway said it recently. Nobody knows. Uh, what the extent, what the effect of all this is going to, to be on the economy. So we're very cautious uh, when we do buy into businesses. We, we, we have been actively buying into, into companies and, and, and uh, but again, not backing up the truck. We're again, focusing on looking at the balance sheet, consistent profitability uh, and, and fair price, which uh, I believe there's there's opportunities out there with, 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 the, with the strong companies at this point. So. Uh, it, it, it is a good time to, to put some of the money in the market. I would say uh, slowly. We're, we're not doing it all, all at once. We, we pick some spots, uh, uh, but, but we are actively uh, looking. OK, well, thanks again for uh, answering those questions. I don't have any other questions at this time, but um, I'd like to um, thank uh, both Alec and Ricardo for the last 30 minutes uh, of, of their time. I thought that this um, went a long way to helping all of us understand what Antares is doing uh, currently to navigate these choppy waters and prepare us for what lies ahead. Um, if anyone on this uh, conference didn't have uh, an opportunity to ask a question, please uh, feel free to get in contact with one of your advisors. We'll be happy to answer any uh, questions or at least pass them on to the portfolio managers and get a response uh, to you. And um, uh, in the meantime, I, I hope everybody remains healthy and positive in the days and weeks to come. Uh, thank you for joining us and uh, have a wonderful day. Thanks again, uh, Alec and Ricardo. Appreciate your time today. Thank you, everyone. Take care.